Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the Mark Twain House and Museum's Trouble Begins at 5.30. Um, my name is Jodie Bryan. As always, I will be kind of your host for the evening. I'm joined this evening with Dr. Perry Class. I'm so excited for today's topic. Um, but before we get going on the main event, um, I have the admin things that so many of you are familiar with now. Um, first, I'd like to thank our sponsors. Um, we got a wonderful grant through Connecticut Humanities this past year um, to support the Trouble at Home and Trouble Begins series. Um, Trouble Begins is also um, presented in part um, by the Center of Mark Twain Studies in Amaya College. Not only do they help us uh, financially, but they also let us use the same name for the program that they use. Um, so thank you to them as always. Um, Couple things as we go through the evening. Um, many of you have found the chat um, that's on the side of the screen. Feel free to talk amongst yourselves there um, throughout the program. Um, we love seeing all the comments. But if you have a question for myself or Perry, please use the ask a question feature that's down at the bottom of the screen. Um, you'll see the chat and then the people count and then it says ask a question. Um, those are the ones we'll uh, try to focus on at the end of the uh, program tonight. Um, as always, we thank you for being here and supporting our programs. Um, if you'd like to support us just a little bit more, there is a green button at the bottom of your screen, kind of at the center, tealish green. Um, it says your support is vital to the Mark Twain House and Museum. Please donate here. Um, every dollar is legitimately and sincerely welcomed um, at this point. Like many institutions struggling through COVID, um, Mark Twain House is one. But thanks to all the generous support we've gotten, we are still here and still delivering programs. So anything you can help us with, we are greatly appreciative. If not, still please stay and enjoy this wonderful program tonight. Um, so, Perry, uh, we are here tonight. Thank you so much for being here. We're here to talk about your book, A Good Time to Be Born, uh, How Science and Public Health Gave Children a Future. Um, so, Perry, you are a professor of journalism and pediatrics at New York University um, and, and writes a weekly column, The Checkup, for the New York Times Science section. Is that correct? That's right. <laughs> Great. Uh, why don't you tell us a little bit more about yourself and how this book came to be? So, I'm trained as a pediatrician, and as you've heard, I write a lot about children's issues and I write a lot about for that reason, I write a lot from the point of view of a pediatrician, but also I write a lot from the point of view of a parent. And I think about um, what it is to be a parent and to be a parent taking care of children. And I've also, um, I've taught courses for undergraduate students on children and childhood um, in which we've looked at the history of childhood. I co-teach with my husband who's a historian. And one of the issues which comes up persistently as I'm presenting the biology and the medicine of childhood and we're considering the history of childhood is I become more and more aware not just of the very long history of um, infant and child mortality, that is to say that through all of human history up until really very recently, people took for granted that losing a child was a very sad thing, but not a very surprising thing that it just was something that happened, that it was unpreventable. And I think it was as I came closer and closer to, well, as it came closer and closer, as I began to realize that when my grandmother was alive 100 years ago in Brooklyn, New York, we were still talking about, oh, one in every 100 live-born children dying before the age of one, and then another probably dying before the age of five. So one, um, not, not, not a sort of distant, remarkable thing, but a 10% infant mortality. I think I said one in a hundred, I should have said 10 in a hundred at the turn okay. of the century. We're yeah. still losing 10, 20 out of every hundred live births. You're losing not as many as you maybe were losing in the middle ages or the Renaissance when you were perhaps losing 30, 40%, but you're losing enough. You're losing a couple of children out of every 10 so that when my grandmother was having her children, that is to say when my parents were being born, if you went around a table with any group of people, rich or poor, 
pretty much everybody around the table would have lost a child, lost a sibling, lost a classmate to one of the kind of standard unavoidable childhood diseases. And I started to think about what it meant, first of all, to have lived with that for parents, for medical professionals. But then I began to think about, so what changed? And how does that rather remarkable first time in history change to where we are after in the second half of the 20th century? How does it affect everything? How does it, how do we see it in art? How do we see it in literature? What's the biology? What's the medicine? And it just, you know, I, I think I became a little obsessed with it is here's something that we as 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 humans have done, which is kind of the biggest thing that that we could have done, we've gone from being a species that had to take for granted that we would lose one in three, one in four of every, ch of, of, every of our children to when I trained in pediatrics in Boston in the 1980s, no child was supposed to be lost. And if something happened, you had to fix it. Something hadn't been made safe, something hadn't been prevented, something hadn't yet been cured. Yeah, yeah, that's it's so great. So I will say, even though we're talking about child death and mortality, I personally, and I've said this to Perry already when prepping for this interview, I found this book so uplifting and so hopeful um, just because to think about all of the, the scientific feats and everything that have happened throughout the years to make it so that you know, when my friends get pregnant and and have babies that I get to spoil, so rarely do we like fear this this thing happening. Um, but as you say, you walk around, you know, you go back just a couple generations, and my mother has an aunt, and I just found out through like ancestry dot com that she had a child who died of the flu. It was her only child, and this explains why she had such a difficult relationship with children and things like that. So we're finding out. It's such a personal thing that hits home, but oh, this book covers so much. So, um, one of the things, um, as I said, it's so uplifting to see all of the different scientific and and societal triumphs that are covered in this book. Um, and one of them for me, when reading through it, is you know, I, I think I said this to you. I knew the name Joseph Salk, but I had no idea who Josephine Baker was. And all of the the female leads in this book is really inspiring. And um, when you were when you were starting to write this book, did you want to highlight these fabulous women, or did they just come about in your research um, naturally? Well, a little of both, because the truth is, the whole time I was writing this book, I kept finding people, uh, men and women, with whom I identified so strongly. And sometimes what I identified with was was their fallibility. Oh. That day, when I was reading the words of Abraham Jacoby, who we think of as the founding father of American pediatrics, who in the second half of of the 19th century. He's just a giant in my field. He founds the first free clinic. He's very socially minded. He's actually a revolutionary. There's a Jeho Jacoby Hospital in the Bronx. When I read him writing about his own helplessness, facing children with diphtheria, and again, there was just this very strong sense of identification. I know what he wanted to do. He wanted to cure, and he couldn't. And he was writing about the temptation to do anything, 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 because it was so impossible not to help. So um, I felt very strong sense of identification with a lot of the people, sometimes be sometimes because they were um, helpless or sad or mistaken. And then I read Josephine Baker's um, autobiography, and she, Sarah Josephine Baker, she's a, a, a girl from Poughkeepsie, and she goes to medical school um, at the end of the 19th century because her Basically, she's got to support her mother and her sister. Her brother's died. Um, her father's gone. And she becomes interested in public health and in the question of whether you can actually prevent the infant deaths. And she writes um, so frankly, so in such a lively, vivid way about this business of deciding that, you know, um, summer heat does not have to kill babies. And it had just been understood, especially in the cities, that 
when summer came, the infant diarrhea came, and we would now understand that that's because the milk is spoiling, that's because the water is not clean, the children are getting diarrhea for a variety of reasons, but they were, you know, she writes about just expecting a thousand deaths a week, and then realizing that if you educate the parents, if you pasteurize the milk, if you take some of these hygienic precautions, and this Without miraculous medicine, this is without antibiotics, this is without IV therapy, this is with public health and hygiene. And the excitement um, that when she writes something like, heat did not necessarily kill babies and the babies can live. Um, yeah, those voices were, were tremendously exciting. And I don't think it's a coincidence that um, some of the people who go in into pediatrics, some of the women who go in, um, have a slightly different take, certainly than the people who've been controlling kind of high-end academic medicine beforehand. They're a little more, they're more interested in the normal child and in child development, and maybe a little more um, hands-on about working with the mothers, but even more than the doctors, and I hope this came through, those public health nurses, that's one of the things Josephine Baker does. She's the first head of the first um, New York Child Hygiene Bureau, which is the first one in the country, and she realizes that what she needs is nurses who will knock on doors, who will work in the schools, who will meet families where they are and spend time making sure parents understand that they actually have this in their power because this idea that babies don't have to get sick and die in the summer, if it's overwhelmingly and amazing for the doctors, think how amazing it is for the parents. This is not something which is just has to happen. It's not sent from above. Yeah. Couple of my uh, the points that kind of resonated with me. One was the like going to the to the families. Um, I'm I'm a fan of call the midwife on on PBS. So just the idea of them going and checking up on, and you know, repeatedly going and caring for, for the children in their own homes was something that I think is just beautiful. Um, the other thing that I really enjoyed was the, um, the idea of having to look at and study, for lack of a better word, study healthy children, right? Like it wasn't just the sick children, it was going and seeing what a normal child look like and, and felt like and what their skin felt like and all these different diagnoses so that you could then figure out what was wrong with the unhealthy baby. The third thing that I really loved um, about these home visits was the line about like a baby like sucking on a piece of sausage and it's just like, oh, they get the, the benefits of garlic and it's like, that's just amazing. That's real life, right? Like no, no child is in a test subject situation um, where they live, you know, everybody has their own home remedies and, and life happens. <laughs> Well, also sometimes, to be honest, when you read some of the turn of the century advice books for parents that were written by very serious, usually male or almost invariably male doctors who honestly, I'm not sure had spent many days one-on-one um, -on -one with a cranky, difficult toddler. <laughs> There's a certain amount, you know, it's like, and you must do this and you should do this, and this is the way you must mix the formula. Whereas the public health nurses, Dr. Baker, you get the feeling that the mothers are answering back. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they're sort of saying, um, come on, nobody's going to actually be able to do that. Right. It. And I think that, you know, that's, that's very important because it's not like you can just say, oh, let's educate the mothers because the mothers know a lot and they're doing their best. The question is, have you found some ways to support them? Have you found some ways? And if you can say to them, look, remember, remember that at the beginning of the 20th century, the idea that these diseases are being caused by invisible microbes is new. The doctors are still arguing about it. There are still a lot of doctors at the turn of the 20th century who are not convinced about all of these, you know, German bacteriologists who keep discovering new bacteria. And um, it's, it's very new. So it's not like you're going into uh, the family home and trying to say, for heaven's sakes, don't you know that, you know, infectious diarrhea is caused by bacteria and viruses? These are new concepts. Mm -hmm they're still arguing about. So, you know, you're, you're actually trying to give people new tools they didn't have before that nobody had before. Right. Yeah. 
Um, so the book is, I believe, 10 chapters full of really interesting um, information. And it is available through our gift shop. Uh, Jennifer will show the link multiple times during this, this in the chat box. So please, please purchase one. It is sincerely fascinating. Um, but so most of what we're going to talk about tonight is kind of in chapter one um, when it comes to like the literary and kind of historical references. Um, and of course, being the Mark Twain house. Twain is involved. Um, so there's lots of, I can think of a, numerous stories with Twain and um, various diseases, but I think the one that pops to mind, of course, is his measles um, and how he uses that both in his personal life and in his writing. So um, can you tell us a little bit about measles uh, to begin with, to kind of give us a baseline and then we can go into to how it affected Twain's life? Sure. So let me start by talking about measles a little bit because measles is a really, really interesting disease. And at the moment that we're living through right now, you may actually hear some parallels and we can sort of, um, I'm not going to go into the history of vaccination, but I just want to say it's a measles story is a really, really interesting one. First thing to know about measles is measles is the most infectious disease that we've got. When measles around before there was a vaccine, pretty literally everyone got measles. And say, when I was training, if you asked people, have you had the measles, adults, um, if they were born before 1957, whether or not they remembered having had the measles, the rule we were taught was if they were born before 1957, they've had the measles because measles is that catching, everybody got it. Measles is the sort of the nightmare disease from an infection point of view. Somebody was on the bus an hour ago and everybody who's been on the bus since has been exposed. You know, in recent years, we've had a, a Disney World um, measles epidemic. We've had, it, it's, it's really catching. The second thing I wanna say about measles is that measles in colonial America, in, you know, here on the East Coast in the, oh, you know, in the 18th century, it was a, really scary disease. Mm -hmm. There was a certain amount of protection perhaps by the um, Atlantic Ocean. People thought that measles cases used to burn themselves out on the long sea trip over. So it wasn't um, all that common, but it turned up periodically. It was not as dangerous as smallpox, which it was often compared to because it's another disease that's catching. It's another disease with a rash. Um, and, you know, another disease that spread in families and communities, but there were some really deadly epidemics. There was an epidemic um, in 1657 um, in Boston that was described um, as, you know, very mild. But then if you remember um, Cotton Mather in 1713 to 1716, Cotton Mather's family was devastated by measles. He was the only one in his household who didn't get sick because he'd had the measles in an earlier ac epidemic. Um, his wife got measles, she gave birth to twins. She got sick with measles, she died of the disease, so did both of the twins, um, uh, little Eliezer and little Martha in the first few weeks of life. And that's interesting from a pediatric point of view because since his wife was vulnerable, she wouldn't have been able to pass any immunities during the pregnancy. So of the children who were born to an immune mother would have had some immunities. Um, the two and a half year old who Mather called my lovely Jerusha died. Um, and Cut Mather actually writes a letter about the right management of the sick under the distemper of the measles. And he felt that it was a much more serious disease in America. So if we fast forward to Mark Twain growing up in Missouri, um, there are periodic devastating, devastating epidemics of measles. And Mark Twain wrote, in 1845, when I was 10 years old, there was an epidemic of measles in the town, and it made a most alarming slaughter among the little people. There was a funeral almost daily, and the mothers of the town were nearly demented with fright. And then again, two years later, when Mark Twain was 12, he writes, the summer came and brought with it an epidemic of measles. For a time, a child died almost every day. The village was paralyzed fright, distress, despair. In the homes, there were no cheerful faces. There was no music. 
There was no singing but of solemn hymns, no voice but of prayer. Now, his mother was desperate to keep him from being exposed, and he deliberately exposed himself and caught the disease, as I'm sure many of you know. And so she had him seen by Dr. Cunningham, the local doctor, and Mark Twain writes, when Dr. Cunningham had made up his mind that nothing more could be done for me, he put bags of hot ashes all over me. He put them on my breast, on my wrists, on my ankles. And so very much to his astonishment and doubtless to my regret, he dragged me back into this world and set me going again. <laughs> One comment I'd like, two comments I'd like to make. The first is that actually um, the young... Mark Twain was probably lucky that Dr. Cunningham wasn't more aggressive. Okay. If you go back and look at what Cotton Mather is advising, um, he's considering dosing um, people with soapy water in a glass of wine. He's considering purges. There are all kinds of um, more aggressive, more dubious therapies. And the truth is, um, even nowadays, we don't have a treatment for measles. We have a vaccine, we can prevent it. But once you get sick, there's nothing to make the measles go away. What we can do nowadays is treat the bacterial pneumonia, which often comes after measles, which used to be devastating. But anyway, um, and I would also mention that there are also doctors when Mark Twain was growing up who believed that you should uh, ble bleed. They believe bloodletting for measles. So again, as I say, um, the ashes were probably a relative. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, and then I would just, um, the other comment I would make is um, now Tom Sawyer gets measles and he mm -hmm. gets really sick with measles. He gets really sick. It's a plot point because he's sort of out of action in the adventures of Tom Sawyer. And then when he sort of comes back to life after being quite dangerously ill, he finds out there's been a religious revival in the town. And, um, you know, everyone's behavior has changed and he's kind of shocked. And then he relapses, which if we had to guess, probably is that bacterial pneumonia, which can follow on measles. And then when he gets over that, he discovers that um, the religious boys have also, quote unquote, relapsed and things. <laughs> yeah. 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 I just, I love, I don't know that it's silly to think in the way, you know, Sam Clemens, Mark Twain's rights. It's, it's always interesting, but just that story of him climbing into the infected person's bed to, to get it all over himself basically and, and catch measles. is such a, a picture in your mind. Um, when I think most of us today would run away instead of climbing into somebody else's bed. <laughs> so. Yeah. Um, so um, the other um, uh, disease that really affected the Clemens family, of course, is diphtheria um, and how it affected Langdon Clemens, the firstborn child. Um, and that's kind of how we how I came to know of your book is that you have a photograph of Langdon in here from our from our collection. Um, so we've gotten the copy of it um, after it was published. Um, so it's thanks to little Langdon that you're here tonight and I'm so thankful to him. Um, so um, Langdon, I know was born in 1870 and he died in 1872 um, at I think 19 months. Um, so, and of diphtheria. So can you tell us a little bit about diphtheria and maybe Langdon's story? Absolutely. So diphtheria is another one of these unbelievably fascinating diseases. Um, measles is around. It shouldn't be, but it is still around. We still worry about it. Diphtheria, at least in this country, is gone. And I think I say in the book that when I was training in pediatrics in the 1980s, when we thought a child had measles, you know, a kid with a really weird rash comes into the emergency room, we're all looking at each other, we've all been vaccinated, there's not much measles around, and you would always go get whoever was the oldest supervising pediatrician in the emergency room, and you'd say, you know, you're a little worried about it, could this be measles, would you come? And infallibly, that person would walk in, look at the kid and say, you know, your grandmothers could make this diagnosis right? So measles was around, but nobody had seen diphtheria. I never saw it. Nobody was telling stories of diphtheria this and diphtheria that. It's, it's pretty forgotten. It's a bacterial disease. It's most severe in children. 
and it's it's a bacteria which functions by by way of a toxin so it releases a, a toxic substance that moves around and attacks different parts of the body it can attack the heart it can attack the kidneys but most dangerously it tends to attack the throat and people sometimes call it the diphtheri croup and what it can do is a what's called a pseudomembrane a thick kind of mess of product tissue dead cells can build up in the throat and can cut off the airway and the reason that children are vulnerable as with so many other diseases is children have very small airways they're vulnerable to respiratory infections you were mentioning the flu they're vulnerable to the flu they're vulnerable to anything that affects the airway because a little bit of swelling or a little bit of what would be a little bit of swelling in an adult size airway or in um, an adult size throat can be much more significant in children and diphtheria was a terrible disease in children. It was again a disease that many children got and it was a disease that many children died of and until the very end of the 19th century there really wasn't anything that anyone could do. Um, and it's one of those diseases which you'll read about um, as with measles in royal families in you know the, the homes of the rich and powerful um it kills baby ruth cleveland um, mm -hmm. in the early 20th century um as rich and poor it measles diphtheria they don't really care but so langdon is actually vulnerable for another reason as you say he's born in 1870 and there's actually i think a scare the month before where they're worried that Olivia's going to have a miscarriage and I think she put on some version of bed rest. And so the baby when he's Langdon when he's born in on November 7th 1870 he's a month old and he weighs four and a half pounds. Okay now again by the standards of premature babies in 2021 that's premature you worry about a baby who's a month early but it's not a miracle preemie baby, right? A normal pregnancy, just for everyone's reference, is 40 weeks. So um, we now, I mean, it's like I'm a neonatologist. Neonatology um, units now regularly and almost routinely take care of children who are born at 28 weeks, so that's 12 weeks early, 26 weeks, so that's 14 weeks early. So we're talking now about baby who's a month early and as you probably know um it's not babies who, who weigh less than a kilo less than 2.2 pounds um very small preemies are routinely cared for and he was four and a half pounds but even so in 1870 that's pretty premature and pretty small and he was nobody expected him to live when he was first born um not his parents not the doctor but he he did live, he survived that very dangerous newborn period, but he was pretty sick on and off for most of his first year of life. Lots of colds, lots of respiratory infections, which if you've ever, you know, premature babies or former premature babies are more vulnerable. They get vaccines. We've been compulsive about trying to make sure um, when they're too young to be vaccinated against flu, you're supposed to vaccinate everybody in the household. Um, right parents of um, premature babies when they bring them home, some of the strongest advocates for influenza vaccine. They just want to believe that everyone around the baby will have had that flu shot. So he was very sick on and off for the first year. And um, in some of the letters that Twain wrote, it was pretty clear that he wasn't sure that the baby was going to, to make it. Um, but he clearly developed a strong fondness for the child. Um, he, um, he, he writes to his wife at some point, she's worried, I think, that he's not really bonded with Langdon. And he writes to his wife, bless your heart, I appreciate the cubby. Um, and shall more and more as he develops and becomes vicious and interesting. To me, he is a very, very dear little rip. Kiss him for me, sweetheart. Um, I have ordered the songbook for him. And then later on, he really seems to be thriving once he's past that first year. And in fact, um, when 
you get to him being about 14 months old or 13 months old in 18, 15 months old in 1872, he's really looking kind of robust. And there's a great letter from Twain um, saying, our baby is flourishing wonderfully. He is white as snow, but seems entirely healthy and is fat and chubby and always cheerful and happy hearted, can say pa and knows enough to indicate which parent he means by it, which is Margaret, the nurse. Mm -hmm. um, he can't walk, though 16 months old, but that is not backwardness of development physically, but precocity of development intellectually, so to speak, since it is development of inherited indolence from his father. Mm -hmm. So the baby is, you know, the by the time he's that that sixteen month old um, getting ready to walk, um, he's doing well, and clearly his father is very connected to him. And then um, the it, it, you read the different accounts. Apparently, he starts to get sick again or sickly again. And then the following May, eighteen seventy two, he gets a very bad cough. Um, they're in Elmira, they go back to Hartford, and um, he's diagnosed with diphtheria, and he dies on June 2nd of 1872, as you said, at 19 months old. And one of the interesting stories that comes out of this is that Mark Twain blames himself. Mm -hmm. He's back to a carriage ride that he made with his son, in which the blanket came off, um, and he says, um, uh, Child had had a cough, seemed to be recovering. His father took him out in the carriage, and during the long drive in an open carriage, Twain said many years later, he'd fallen into a reverie and let the fur blanket slip off Langdon, and that by the time the coachman noticed this quote, the child was almost frozen. Um, and so in 1906, which is 34 years later, Twain is writing, I have always felt shame for that treacherous morning's work and have not allowed myself to think of it when I could help it. Yeah, I think, I mean, all the all the entries that I've read so far with uh, Mark Twain and Sam Clemens and his son, and even those daughters, the, I, I love Sam Clemens as a father. Like that's such, it's so heartwarming and so just the, the care and attention and the, I don't know, fun and humor he he had with with all of his children, even Langdon at you know at such a young age, um, is just beautiful. Um, so one of the other things, um, kind of uh, you know, taught in your book that you mentioned about um, you know the children dying young and how it was such a common occurrence back then, but yet there was still this sense mentality, right? And and um, there became this proliferation of obituary poems and um, about child and loss. Um, and I know that Twain was very vocal in his, oh, about them <laughs> and, and things. And um, Emmeline Granger Ford is one of his fictional um, representations of that distaste. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more about her? Absolutely. So um, one of the things that I was playing with a lot in the book was the question of a whole variety of writers, what they wrote about in their in their fiction. Um, you know, Mark Twain, Harriet Beecher Stowe, Charles Dickens, but then also looking at the experience that they lived and not necessarily trying to draw any one to one um, parallels, but just sort of saying in an era in which childhood mortality touches almost every family, um, you write differently. You're writing for an audience. You can assume that many, if not most of them, will have had very firsthand experience of losing children. And so, um, and of course, you get the most sentimental child scenes in history from the death of Little Eva in Uncle Tom's Cabin to... Mm -hmm. Nell in Charles Dickens in the old curiosity shop, you know, and, and there are a bunch more, some of which don't, we, we are, I mean, we, do, we don't have time to talk about little Henry. Yeah. The child is called little somebody. It's not a good prognostic. <laughs> yeah. Generally assume that child is not going to make it out of the book. But in any case, um, and that what's interesting, I think, is that that sentimentalism 
also provokes a certain um, irascibility in, in many readers, um, and that those seem to go together. So just as, you know, you remember um, the Oscar Wilde remark that one must have a heart of stone to read the death of Little Nell without laughing, um, Mark Twain, at a moment when we probably don't remember the obituary poetry of the 19th century, Mark Twain made it immortal by satirizing it. He made it immortal. Mm -hmm. the, the most clear presence of that genre is now um, his account in um, The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn of um, the prodigy child amateur obituary poetess, um, Emmeline Grangerfield. Grangerford, and, and I'm just going to, um, if I may, I'll read you a tiny bit of it um, in which they he's been taken into this, what seems to him a very, very nice house by the Grangerfords, and he's sort of inventorying what he sees, um, and he's telling you that they have, there was a lot of other books, there was nice split bottom chairs, they had pictures hung on the wall, mainly Washingtons and Lafayettes and Battles and Highland Marys, and one called Signing the Declaration. There was some that they called crayons, which one of the daughters, which was dead, made her own self when she was only 15 years old. They was different from any pictures I ever see before, blacker mostly than is common. One was a woman in a slim black dress, belted under, small under the armpits with bulges like a cabbage in the middle of the sleeves, and a large black scoop shovel bonnet with a black veil and white slim ankles crossed about with black tape, and very wee black slippers, and the uh, picture's called Shall I Never See Thee More Alas, because she's leaning pensive on a tombstone under a weeping willow. And another one is a lady um, with a dead bird. And underneath the picture, it said, I shall never hear thy sweet chirrup more alas. And there are more similarly gloomy pictures. Um, and he says about Emmeline, the daughter of the house who made the pictures, everybody was sorry she died because she had laid out a lot more of these pictures to do. And a body could see by what she had done, what they had lost. But I reckon that with her disposition, she was having a better time in the graveyard. Um, and then what they what he goes on to say is that um, she kept a scrapbook when she was alive and she would write poetry whenever there was an obituary out of her own head. It was very good poetry, Huck says. This is what she wrote about a boy by the name of Stephen Dowling Botts that fell down a well and was drowned. And did young Stephen sicken, and did young Stephen die? And did the sad hearts thicken, and did the mourners cry? No, such was not the fate of young Stephen Dowling Botts. Though sad hearts round him thickened, t'was not from sickness as shots. No whooping cough did rack his frame, nor measles drear with spots. Not these impaired the sacred name of Stephen Dowling Botts. Um, oh no, the list with tearful eye, whilst I his fate did tell, his soul did from this cold world fly by falling down a well. They got him out and emptied him, alas, it was too late. His spirit was gone for to sport aloft in the realms of the good and great. And the truth is that a lot of academic thought about obituary poetry nowadays is trying to figure out who was the model for Emmeline Grangerford and which of the um, 19th century ob obituary poets was he writing and were they really as bad as that? And yes, they were. <laughs> and, um, so he sort of, um, he may have despised the genre, but he also immortalized it. And he also writes uh, a really strong essay about it, which is collected in the 1906 collection of the $30,000 bequest, in which again, he insists that he's quoting real obituary poems and he's he's mocking them. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, one of the uh, uh, authors that you just mentioned um, is Harry Beecher Stowe, who of course is our Nook Farm neighbor. Um, our the Mark Twain House in Hartford is literally just across the lawn from Harry Beecher Stowe House. Um, she and uh, Cummins had. Um, child loss in common. Um, she lost uh, one of her children, Charlie, um, at a, I think only at a year. Um, did uh, He died of cholera, correct? Yep. Um, so can you tell us a little bit more about Charlie and cholera? 
Sure. Well, again, I was interested in her lived experience since she does in The Death of Little Eva create um, uh, a 19th century child death scene, which becomes almost instantly iconic, famous, acted out on, depicted over and over. Um, you know, you can, you know, you can see a, a version of it acted out in The King and I, and everyone is supposed to recognize it immediately. And she had, like many women of the era, she had a difficult and tragic maternal history in many ways, but she lost her young son, Charlie, in the terrible cholera epidemic in Cincinnati, where they were living in the 1860s. Um, her husband was teaching at the um, theological seminary there. And she, she writes him letters. He's away actually taking the water cure when this is happening. And he's in Brattleboro, Vermont, and she's writing to him and warning him that he should not um, come home because because it's so dangerous and um, so I'm I'm sorry I, I said 1860s that um, that's when she's writing the book 1849 when um, this happens and she writes these painful painful letters about Charlie getting sick Charlie seeming to get better Charlie dying and um, and what she says later over and over and over. So Charlie dies um, in the summer of 1849 in the cholera epidemic in Cincinnati. She then publishes Uncle Tom's Cabin as a serialized book in 1851 to 52. And it's a sensation. And it's such a sensation, she gets letters from all over the world asking her what are the circumstances in which she imagined this book. And what she answers pretty consistently is this. I have been the mother of seven children, the most beautiful and the most loved of whom lies bearing, buried near my Cincinnati residence. It was at his dying bed and at his grave that I learned what a poor slave mother may feel when her child is torn away from her. And so I write a fair amount in my book about this question of kind of what do you do with the sorrow and the grief? What do you century parents often turn to activism of very specific kinds. Um, someone whose child dies in a car crash, um, who was a child too old to be in an infant seat, decides that it should be law that a four-year-old needs to be in a booster seat and can't be in the front seat of the car. We're going to have a law and it's going to be named after my child. So no other child will die that way. And I'm sort of looking back here at Harriet Beecher Stowe in the 1850s taking this terrible loss and saying, I'm going to turn this around so that there's a kind of grief and a kind of loss of a child which can be prevented. There's nothing anyone can do about cholera, any more than about diphtheria, any more about measles. But I am thinking of people who feel this grief in a way that we could stop it, we could prevent it. And I think that's a very interesting take on one of, one of the ways that parents all through recent history, find to cope with this kind of grief. Yeah. Oh, it's a hard topic. It really is. But I will say that you handle it beautifully in the book, and and throughout the all the chapters, it's the these these questions that you pose of of and taking us trying to take us back to that reality of of you know what we think now versus what they what they were dealing with and thought then is so different yet it's so close in history so um you handle all those questions beautifully well harriet beecher stowe knows that her readers she she actually addresses them directly mm -hmm. text um in you know to sort of say to them um you know to take for granted um she says oh mother that reads this has there never been in your house a drawer or a closet, the opening of which has been to you like the opening again of a little grave? That's the drawer where the dead child's clothing is stored. Ah, happy mother that you are, if it has not been so. And then she turns around at the end of the book and she says, and she again, you know, this is the, the 19th century, you preach directly to your audience. You don't <laughs> get in your way. So this is Harriet Beecher Stowe saying, 
by the sick hour of your child, by those dying eyes which you can never forget, by those last cries that wrung your heart when you could neither help nor save, by the desolation of that empty cradle, that silent nursery, I beseech you, pity those mothers that are constantly made childless by the American slave trade. Mm -hmm. It's so powerful. And I do think that one of the things um, in your book that I, I really appreciated is while these deaths and diseases, you know, span all classes, whether you're rich or poor, children get affected of it, you do confront the, the racial disparities that happen and um, slave trade and the nurse, you know, the wet nurses and those kinds of things. And this actually leads us great into one of the questions from our viewers where it says, uh, progress at reducing infant mortality has not been uniformly spread both across countries and within the United States. Infant mortality is two to three times as high or high amongst African Americans as with the white people. What public health measures should we be taking to address these disparities? So that is the best of questions. So let me say a couple of things about it. Um, there has been it's it's a, a balance because I have to acknowledge that there's also been tremendous progress in the African American community because the rates were also much, much higher in the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th. So the um, progress that's been made has actually reduced those rates very dramatically and saved an extraordinary number of children. But just as extraordinary and much more terrible is that the disparities persist. And that even though we are now talking about an overall infant mortality rate in this country of six, that is to say, out of every thousand live births, every thousand out of every thousand live births, between six and seven children don't make it to their first birthday. So that's down from well over a hundred of those children at the turn of the century. It is still double or more in black families. It is still higher in indigenous families, higher, it is higher um, in um, Hispanic families. So that is the focus at this point of a tremendous amount of research and thought. Um, let me say a couple of things about current infant mortality rates. Most of the most of the under five, the child mortality that happens now in this country is infant mortality. That is to say, the children who make um, the children who make it to a year of age, almost all of them make it to five. And the ones who are mostly talking about trying to prevent accidents, trying to prevent drowning, trying to prevent car crashes, we're not mostly talking about diseases. Second of all, most of that under one year of age is actually related to birth. It's in the first life, sometimes the first weeks of life. And what that means is that a tremendous amount of it is connected to pregnancy, the conditions and circumstances of pregnancy and birth. So I was saying to you about Langdon Clemens, he was premature, but by today's standards, he wasn't very premature. So probably if we want to correct disparities, our goal has to be to think about correcting disparities that actually relate to the circumstances of pregnancy and birth, which is complicated because we're all really talking here um, both about the health care that women receive, about the different the, the health disparities which affect adult health, um, the mothers, and also the disparities in whether we're you know providing the right kind of primary preventive care. But the first First and foremost goal would probably be to prevent prematurity, to provide really good, equitable prenatal care, and then to look at some of the specifics. We're looking at data which show that the treatment that people get in one hospital may vary from the treatment in another hospital. We're looking at a whole lot of different ways that you want to make sure that people are being treated equitably. Okay. Um, so there's lots of questions and I'll just say to everybody in the audience that, um, if we don't get to your question, cause we only have about 10 minutes left, um, I'll, we'll, uh, email them to Perry and we'll get some answers and we'll put them in the chat in the, in a couple of days and let you know when they're there. So if we don't get to your question. Don't worry. Um, but we'll get to a couple more. Um, so another one is you mentioned, uh, Cotton Mather at the beginning of this, um, 
And one of our audience says um, that he was also one of the first colonial American to vaccinate himself and his family against smallpox. Um, is that true? Um, yeah, and the story on that is that he had learned from um, an enslaved person who had brought the technique from Africa where um, now he didn't vaccinate himself. He okay. variolated himself. That is to say, what he was able to do was not the word. All right. The, the word vaccine actually comes from the name of the cowpox virus, the vaccinia virus, which was used to protect against smallpox. If you would get, you know, the observation was that dairy maids didn't get smallpox because they got cowpox. They got this much milder infection, turned on their immune systems, not that anyone knew there were immune systems, and they protected them against smallpox. Mather didn't have that. That's too early for that. What he had, which is the same thing that Lady Mary Wortley Montague brings back from um, Constantinople, um, what he has is, um, or Istanbul then, or what, what he has is the possibility to get a very mild smallpox infection by taking the scab or the pus, something from someone who's got smallpox and giving it to somebody who's never had smallpox, hoping for a very mild case of smallpox. It's called variolation after variola, which is the smallpox virus's name. And the only problem with it is that somebody's giving you smallpox. <laughs> Case, like you're supposed to, you're fine and it's and you're saved. And if you don't, you get a bad case of smallpox. You can give it to other people, and it's 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 a hard thing to control. And it's not surprising that it scares people, but it also protects people until um, Jenner and vaccination come along at the end of the 18th century. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that whole getting smallpox thing is kind of a kind of a bummer. Um, so um, I don't know if you know this. I definitely don't. Again, to to all the twainiacs in the audience, to please be kind to me. I'm still. I'm. I've only been here a year. I'm still learning. So I don't well, know the answer to this. Maybe somebody on, uh, on on the program who does. Who yeah, does. maybe somebody does. If, if Perry, if you don't, but um, the question is, did Mark Twain interact with any epidemiologists or doctors to educate himself or influence public health? So I don't know. Okay. I have a, a book here on uh, Mark Twain in medicine, and I'm sure that if you gave me um, a little time, I could find it. Um, I think that I don't, I don't know about, um, I mean, he say lives through the great cholera epidemics of the 19th century, but I haven't looked it up. I could, if you, if you talked among yourself, I could look it up. <laughs> Also look it up later and respond, and and as I say, there may be somebody on here who knows. Um. Yeah. Okay. So let me. Also, they as people vote, the questions move up and down. So I always have to like go back and look and see um, what else is here. Um, so likewise. Um, yeah, so one of our, one of our, uh, Patrick Ober, who is a doctor and has been wonderfully um, one of our Troll Begin speakers um, prior to this, he says he was interested in that for sure. Um, so I, yeah, so likewise, and again, we probably aren't able to answer this and we'll either look it up or maybe get uh, Dr. Ober to help. But um, the question is, as Mark Twibb lived through the beginning of the progressive era, what thoughts did he express about the efforts to mitigate the social practices and conditions that promoted disease? Um, how well read was he in the current literature? Um, so I'm, I know Mark Twain, again, not an expert. Please don't, please don't hold me to any of these answers. But I do know he was always involved in so many things that um, I know Pat did a, is, has answered some of those questions in previous troubles and things. Um, but I don't, yeah, I didn't know if any of your research, um, other than your book, Obit Poetry, came across any of that. No, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to try to answer because I don't think I know, but I bet, okay. I, I, I bet you've got someone on this, on this, in this group who could answer it. Yeah, no worries. Um, so um, it is uh, 25 and um, we'll try to get answers to, to those questions that we can't answer tonight. But um, I want to thank you again, Perry, for, for coming on and uh, talking with me tonight. Again, everybody, uh, a good time to be born. It's available in the Mark Twain House um, and Museum gift shop. 
um, signed by Perry. Um, it really is an excellent book. Um, tonight's been fascinating, and it's really just the tip of the iceberg of all the interesting things that are in this book, um, all the interesting characters, both literary and real. Um, it was it was truly, I found, again, my personal experience, truly hopeful at the end of it. It made me feel very good um, about all the, all the measures that have been taken in the past and everything that might be in our own futures. Um, so, Terry, thank you so much again for, for agreeing to be one of our trouble speakers. It's been a pleasure to talk with you. It's been a great pleasure, and I'm so glad you felt that way because I meant the book that way. <laughs> We're, we might be smarter than we think. This was, I mean, I'll say one more thing about this. This wasn't one campaign. This wasn't like, let's end polio with one clear goal. This was a lot of different people, public health, epidemiology, medicine, pure science, um, sanitation, parents, educators, and kind of look what we did. Look mm -hmm. how different it was when I trained in pediatrics in the 1980s. Look what we did for ourselves as a species, for our children. And just to circle back to that first very good question, which is that it wasn't equitably distributed across the world either, it's actually gotten a whole lot better in the last decade and a half. Infant and child mortality around the world has actually been dropping. It's been coming closer to where it should be. And one of the things I think I'll, I'll close with this that we have to make sure um, in the current situation we're in is that it doesn't push things back too far, doesn't push down our, in, our immunization rates, doesn't destroy public health structures. I mean, we've seen that public health structures without too much um, high technology can actually be very powerful and we have to make sure that we don't lose ground on this. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So thank you to Perry again. Thank you to our audience and um, the chat will remain. This has all been recorded so you can rewatch it. Uh, again, we'll try to get answers to the questions that we didn't answer tonight. Um, if you enjoyed the program, please donate, click that button at the bottom of the screen. Um, and we'll see you um, next month um, at our next Trouble Begins. Thank you, everybody, and good night.